Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. There is an old tradition that says that St. Luke the Evangelist was the first iconographer, which is to say that St. Luke was the first Christian artist. And the story goes that St. Luke was the first one to paint a portrait not only of Jesus, but also of his mother. And the portrait that he painted became uh, the, the uh, inspiration for all of the succeeding depictions of the Madonna and child. Now that story comes about 700 years after Jesus' resurrection, so it might not be historically true, but there is a grain of truth to the tradition. St. Luke was an artist. Now he did not dabble in canvas and paints, but he dabbled with ink and parchment. He does paint the very vivid picture of Jesus that we have in the gospel, not with images, but with words that he crafts. The picture that emerges of Jesus is one that is very beloved to us. It's the gospel of St. Luke that gives us some of the most uh, beloved events that we have in Jesus' life and also his teaching. And St. Luke, you know, did write in King James English. And so it, those words have that sort of immortal quality. It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. We cherish many of the things that are unique to Luke's gospel. He's the only one who has the full Christmas story, you know, of the journey to Bethlehem. He has the parable of the Good Samaritan. He has the Pharisee and the tax collector, Lazarus and the rich man. He has Jesus' appearance on the road to Emmaus to his two disciples after his resurrection. All of those are from the pen of St. Luke. Now, since it is St. Luke's day, naturally you probably want to know more about the man himself. And the truth is we don't really know that much about St. Luke. He's got a handful of references, all of them from St. Paul in the epistles, and they're all passing references. We have the one today, the last one from 2 Timothy. Paul is writing from prison, the waiting execution, and he simply says, Luke alone is with me. The only other thing we really know about Luke is that Luke was a Gentile. He was a doctor, and he was the constant companion of Paul from a certain point in Paul's missionary travels. Luke is faithful to him unto death. Some of the fathers of the church claim that Luke was one of the 72 that we heard about in the gospel today, that Jesus sends out the 72 disciples ahead of him. They might be, but we don't know for sure. There's a story that St. Luke goes and he carries the gospel after Jesus' ascension to Greece, and he is martyred there, but it's hard to be sure of any of that. Luke is shrouded in obscurity. There's really no miracles attributed to St. Luke, no heroic episodes. There are extraordinary things about him. He's an extraordinary writer. He possesses that gift, as we know. He is a true blue friend to St. Paul the Apostle. And in our epistle, Paul is giving his final instructions, not to Luke, but to Timothy. He says, as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And here we actually come to the most extraordinary thing about St. Luke. The most significant thing about him was that like Timothy, he was an evangelist, that he was a proclaimer of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was his life's work. Now, Timothy gets more mentions in the New Testament, but nevertheless, they both shared in the same calling. And when you think about it, it's the words of St. Luke that have been immortalized forever. Now, I tend to think that St. Luke would be rather pleased that even though there have been succeeding generations of Christians like us that name our congregations for him, we nevertheless don't really know anything about him. 
I think Luke likes it that way because Luke wasn't called to recognition or to celebrity. All of those other stories about his martyrdom, about his being an artist, those things come later and perhaps they're meant to fill in the gaps because Luke was so obscure in his life and his career. And Luke would have thought that all of that stuff was much ado about nothing. He would think that because for the simple reason that he was an evangelist. Luke only cared about the content of what he proclaimed and of obeying the Lord who called him. And it says, St. Paul says, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Now, I, I'm a little partial, but I think that St. Luke is actually a really good name for a congregation. It's a good name because we do follow in the train of all of the evangelists, of Luke and Timothy and Paul and all of the apostles. We are called to do the work of evangelists and to fulfill this ministry. Not everyone's called to preach, but we are all called to make that good confession of faith in Christ. We are called to do exactly as Luke does, not to seek recognition of the world or even the church. Because who really cares if anybody notices? Luke did not seem to pay much mind. He only wanted to proclaim one thing, and he only wanted to be remembered for telling one story. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. There was a missionary in the spirit of St. Luke who said, preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. May that be said of us, that our name would only be a testament to the grace of God in Jesus Christ, that our life may simply be hidden with Christ in God, and may our legacy only be that there are others who profess and call upon the Lord Jesus as Savior. Preach the gospel. Die. Be forgotten. Now that's the situation as it stands now. But we'd be remiss to think that obscurity is the end of the story. You see, St. Paul doesn't think this. And Luke, when you read Luke's gospel, as we've done this year, this year in our lectionary, our focus has been on St. Luke. St. Luke has a fondness for talking about this reversal that's coming, that where it's the humble and the have-nots and the marginalized and the persecuted, these are the ones who will be exalted. Mary, when she sings the Magnificat, she praises God and she says, God has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. And you know that Jesus says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. For the time being, we are among the ranks of the humble. If you don't feel that you're very humble, don't worry, God will humble you. He will. And we are among the ranks of the humble, like St. Luke, who's keeping St. Paul company in prison waiting for the ultimate humiliation of the hands of his Roman executioners. But St. Paul doesn't lose heart, and we don't lose heart either. He says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. And henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Well, the crown is coming, brought to you by the king of it all. St. Luke knows this as well. Luke has traced the humble way of Jesus, not only in his gospel, but in his own life and his ministry. And Luke knows, if you follow the pattern of Jesus' life, that first comes humiliation and cross and death. First comes the war, which will be ended by victory when death is swallowed up by life. First is a crown of thorns, 
and then it's the crown of righteousness at the Lord's appearing. And the Lord will bring us safely through. Now, perhaps like Luke, our names might be little footnotes on the pages of history, probably less than that, actually. But that doesn't matter because of the crown that is coming. That is through him, we are more than conquerors, through him who loved us. Jesus shares with us his conquest. He brings us peace on earth, goodwill toward men, the way that Luke writes about. It's by his cross and passion that he forgives us, for we know not what we do. It's when you're down in the dust and the ash heap of your own mortality that he exalts us at the proper time. And all of those things St. Luke wrote about marvelously. I would like to think that St. Paul writes these letters. This is his last letter, by the way. He writes his letter to Timothy. He sits down his pen, and he looks over in the semi-darkness of his cell. He sees Luke, who smiles at him unassumingly while they wake for the footsteps on the cobblestone, for the creaking of the iron door, for the command that says, Paul, come with us. And Paul goes out. He leaves Luke behind. He goes out into the courtyard. He sees the glint of the sword. He sees the basket for his head. I'd like to think he thinks about the words of St. Luke that give so much comfort. And maybe about the words that he just penned with Luke at his side. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen.